it's uh, great to be with you. Um, I'm sorry that um, you know I'm a rather monotonish, um, not very intense person when I uh, preach, so I'm really sorry if I went too boring today. But actually, uh, I, I think this is an exciting and wonderful passage, and I really am thrilled to be with you today, okay? Uh, it is um, probably one of the most uh, interestingly structured passages in all of Scripture. And I'm really attacking here the entire Joseph narrative. That's because to understand uh, the uh, the Joseph Merritt, we really need to look at it as a whole. One of the things that uh, immediately comes to mind, as you can see here, is that the verse that was just read to you, thank you so much, uh, Taylor, uh, emphasizes the fact that there is a doubleness here. And what is intriguing and interesting is, is that in this entire literary unit, there are numerous, numerous, um, what I would call binary structures. Uh, they are uh, seen in the doublets, they are seen in the painters, they are seen in juxtapositions. In fact, um, there are quite a number of things uh, that we can uh, look at. And the reason I wanted to give this into your hands, this kind of a bulletin insert sorts, is to help you kind of follow along with us uh, and to have something to take along with you so that you can reflect uh, more fully on this uh, after today. What you can see here is, is that it's not just that there are uh, various different kinds of pairs, uh, two uh, dreams at the beginning, two dreams later, two more dreams, etc., etc. Rather, it is uh, even more complex because there are two major movements, one taking us to a climax, the other one taking us to a resolution. And what we can see in these two movements is uh, that they are structured in such a way as they play off of one another. You can see, if you look at letter B, for instance, in particular, that, um, and this is actually very important to the narrative, that um, Joseph is not present uh, in um, letter B, and in B prime, he is um, only nominally uh, present. And this is not uh, insignificant because instead of Joseph uh, being present in each of these, it is his boy, Judah, who is in fact uh, present. And so this all is going to develop. And so as we move further, we can see that the first movement here uh, begins to um, narrate for us very clearly that um, there is a structuring that, uh, that Joseph is going to move to a power of, uh, a position of power where he could, in fact, inflict revenge on his brothers. When they show up, the potential for revenge is certainly there, but that will not be carried out, and we will see, of course, uh, further resolutions. Everything else from F prime all the way back out to A prime is going to work toward resolution and fulfillment. This is, I think, uh, quite, quite important. Underlying the question, the question that's underlying in every turn here from the get-go, in fact, it is going to be introduced in a very dramatic kind of way, is in which son will rulership of the family be rooted? This is actually the big question of Joseph, the story. It is, where will this be rooted? Jacob has his thoughts. God has his, okay? And so the obvious question, the obvious answer uh, as you read the narrative is, of course, ah, Joseph, okay? But we will be surprised, and this is one of the wonderful things about the binary nature of the way in which this is all presented. That, by the way, reduces the potential for irony, and this entire passage is incredibly rich with irony, okay? So we will see some of that as well. So the final resolution, of course, is going to go down a different path. We will see that the two interludes, in fact, really do matter. So when we go to this a little bit uh, more fully, we can see, of course, that, um, that in the first instance, Joseph and Jacob are uh, present and together. And they are going to uh, work uh, in, in tandem in the way in which God uh, initially, uh, the way that this initially gets started. 
And so the movement is going to actually start in a very significant way, and that is there's going to be an unusual grammatical construction. Yeah, this is why you study Hebrew. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. <laughs> because this particular verbal form is going to boom, pop us. This isn't, this isn't the way you say this. And yet, by saying it this way, as one lawmaker uh, noted, this is uh, going to give us the inciting event that is going to spawn everything else. In other words, this making of an ornate robe is going to spawn everything. Jacob's choice is Joseph. He's going to be, oh really? And so as a result, he's going to unleash a whole series of events. As you know, of course, there are many other um, things that are involved here. There are, of course, the dreams. There are the, uh, the various ways in which uh, Joseph is going to be humbled. We see, of course, that there is the ornate robe uh, that has been given as the initial uh, way in which the, uh, Jacob is trying to signal uh, his choice. Uh, the irony, of course, is that he is going to find himself in a pit. Now, he doesn't find himself in the pit with the intention of being murdered by his uh, brothers simply because uh, they just got irritated with him that afternoon. You have to do some things to get people to the point that they want to kill you. <laughs> Not only does he have dreams, but he willingly shares them and he lords over his brothers. It's rather apparent from this entire thing. He's just a darn brat. And so they are going to throw him into the pit. And it is here that we first see Judah. Because Judah will come up with a better plan. Why kill the guy when we can make a few shackles on him? Okay? So we'll sell him to some folks, these Ishmaelites, Midianites, who are the pair. And there we'll take him out of our hair, and that'll be the end of the whole matter. Of course, that is what transpires, and it is quite ironic indeed that the man who has been selected by his father, who has been given this uh, great uh, position, is now thrown not only into the pit, but now is in slavery on his way to Egypt. And it is here that he will be raised up into Potiphar's household. Here again, there will be a symbol of identity. The symbol of identity is, in fact, his cloak. And it will be used against him to, of course, put him in prison. Once again, a great irony indeed. But then again, he will be raised up, and this time, of course, in the Pharaoh's household, where he will receive a signet ring, a linen robe, and a golden collar. And irony indeed, the Messiah of Egypt is a Hebrew. Wow. The dreams play a very important role in no uncertain terms. In fact, they formulate a pattern of two, 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 and later we will have one dream of Jacob in the original <coughs> section. You will see that they come in different ways and that they are uh, uh, utilized in various different capacities, and yet what is really at the very heart of it is all the dreams come true. That's because only the true God is sovereign over the future. One of the dreams, of course, that will be dreamed is, of course, what we were reading today about the gold the uh, uh, seven uh, cows. Here you can see the seven cows and the bull of heaven. This is uh, from the Egyptian uh, book of the dead, spelled 148. And what is particularly interesting is that this is undoubtedly what was perhaps in the mind of our, um, uh, that, that was a rather interesting combination. Uh, I'm sorry that it's about as uh, oxymoric as you could make it. In any event, um, the point here is this was, I'm sure, what the uh, Egyptian magicians were trying to wrestle with as they looked at uh, the dream of the Pharaoh, because in their mind, it has these kinds of connotations. Okay. In fact, uh, we see that in the same spell, there's another illustration in which uh, the celestial bulls are shown together with the 
people who have been not pictured in this instance, but they are the ones who provide sustenance for the deceased. This is what uh, I think is in the uh, um, in the background and what has been being utilized by Joseph in, in terms of understanding exactly what God is doing. But what is clear is that the, the, the Egyptian dream interpreters could not uh, decipher here uh, what, in fact, the dream was communicating. Only Joseph was able to do so. Joseph will be raised to the Seer of Egypt. Wow! What an office! Second only to Pharaoh. And here you can see uh, the investiture of a vizier. We can see here, uh, in the case of uh, the Pharaoh sitting on his throne, the vizier receiving a collar. Uh, a number of our translations say chain. <laughs> this isn't any old ordinary chain. This is one of these big old fat collars that uh, one can see in some uh, museums. They are highly impressive indeed, and it will be indicative of his position of authority and power. You can see, of course, that Egyptians were clean shaven. They shaved their heads, they shaved their uh, beards, they uh, even shaved their eyebrows, lots of body hair. This is because of the life's problems and things in Egypt. If you eliminate that, even uh, the famous Nefertiti, even our, uh, the, the, the woman whose picture here is actually a goddess, uh, she's wearing a wig. And the famous saw uh, Nefertiti with her crown uh, is in fact bald. I mean, she's been shaved. Okay? So we can see, I think, rather clearly one of the reasons why his brothers wouldn't have recognized him in the first place when they come. Because when they come, they're going to, of course, encounter the disease. They're not going to think, oh, well, this is Joseph. <laughs> Hardly. It's been years. They, have, they, they don't recognize him, of course, right off the bat because he's shaven, he's uh, uh, cleaned up, everything. He's uh, using the Egyptian language, he's using a translator, and of course he's walking like an Egyptian, and that undoubtedly also has been made impossible to uh, discern who he was. The first movement is really crucial here because as we move through the narrative, we encounter, of course, Joseph being sold into slavery, which, by the way, there are two traumatic events in his life. One, being sold into, thrown into the pit and sold into slavery. The second, of course, being uh, thrown into prison. Both of these changed who Joseph was. He was no longer the brat. He's no longer going to be the precocious youth. He is going to be a very different person as a result of the humiliation that he undergoes as a result of these findings. But the, inter the interesting thing is, we now get in chapter 38 the story of Judah and Tamar. What a sweet tale! I mean, think about it. If a Victorian Christian had written the Bible, this would not be in it. Sex, sex, ugh, and, and devastation, and corruption, and problems, and by the way, the family is marrying Canaanites, and it's going downhill, and if this continues, there will be no family. So the fact of the matter is, Israel needs salvation from itself in Canaan. This is important. This is crucial. And by the way, we can see within Judah what the Torah would say is wrong. Approaching the prostitute, propositioning her, having sex with her. The irony, of course, is it's his own, it's his own uh, uh, daughter-in-law, but he doesn't know that. Judah looks pretty bad here, doesn't he? He shows us most clearly what you ought not to be doing. And the irony is juxtaposed in the very next chapter, look at uh, chapter 39, it is Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Twice, there's the hearings and the, the, the binaries, twice she tries to, to, to seduce him, and he literally, literally flees fornication. Wow. Here we see 
in a very clear way how this entire passage is, in fact, Torah. It is law. It is instructing in uh, how uh, the Israelites are to, to live. Further, we see, of course, that it introduces this character of Judah. And by the way, I can't go into all the details here, but every single one of these sections, okay, have numerous catchwords and phrases and nexuses that tie everything together. It is a marvelously constructed unity. So in the next uh, instance, we see, of course, that Joseph finds himself in the prison, and there is, of course, the, the dreams of the uh, uh, baker and the candlestick maker. Oh, no, no I'm sorry, that's a different story. <laughs> I mean, the uh, cup bearer. Okay, and they're both accused of some kind of treason. And one of them is actually guilty. And, of course, they have their dreams. And Joseph, who had taken a um, correspondence course in Freudian dream interpretation, <laughs> is able to deal with their dreams and to give them the exact uh, meaning. I mean, this is not uh, telling us, okay, if you want to be successful as a believer in a foreign land, you know, learn how to interpret dreams, because you can make a living at it. <laughs> All right, no, no, no. This is hardly the case, right? Okay. Now, Joseph understands from the get-go that this is of God, okay? And he is able to interpret uh, their dreams accordingly. One is raised back up, the other, of course, is in pain. The, um, the next uh, item, of course, is then uh, the two trips, okay, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the family. This, of course, after Joseph has languished in prison a little bit longer, a couple more years, years, and as a result, uh, there's another dream of the Pharaoh, and lo and behold, uh, these double dreams are what are interpreted, and I've already touched on that. And so now the brothers are coming, and they come in two instances. First of all, to get grain because of famine, and Joseph uses this opportunity, of course, to have a charade with them. That is, he has uh, got to get information. Is Benjamin still alive? That's pretty important information. He cannot trust their word. Would you trust their word that Benjamin is still alive? I wouldn't. So the only way he can fax or send an email to Canaan and say, hey, is Benjamin there? Can I talk to him? You know, uh, that doesn't work. So he has to physically get Benjamin there, so he does. At this point, he wants to now bring his father to um, the land to make sure that he is taken care of. And, of course, we see that um, uh, at this particular point, the Sharad, the Shari, must Devolve because uh, he cannot contain himself any longer, and this brings us to then uh, the conclusion. This conclusion is an important one indeed. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me. I'm going to read chapter uh, 45, and I'm going to read verse uh, 4. He has revealed to, him, to his brothers that I am Joseph in verse 3, which must have freaked the living daylights out of them. <laughs> they must have looked at him and gone, Uh, uh, it is him! Oh, oh, oh no! Uh, and they must be expecting guards. Uh, hey, you know that, that the new torture that we just uh, started working with? Uh, take that one out and work him. Okay, with that. And Reuben, you know, at least trying to save my life, but well, we'll he, we won't give him quite as much of a uh, torture. Okay. Mm, no, that's not because he reveals who he is, and then he says something very important. This is as important as chapter 50, verse 20. When Joseph told his brothers uh, that it was him, they, he said, come close to me. When they came, when they had done so, he said to them, this is in verse 4, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold you into, you sold into Egypt. And now, verse 5, do not be distressed and do not be angry with 
with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Verse 7, for God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives from a great, with a great deliverance or by a great deliverance. Joseph has already come to grips with some things. I don't know when it happened. Did it happen on that road from Dokkan, which, by the way, is not one of the major highways. It's a secondary route. So Ishmaelites, Midianites coming along that road, it was more happen chance, or is it happen chance? What the world calls chance, fate, luck, the Bible, declares again and again and again, G-O-D. It's God. It is God. But he's taken on this road to Egypt. He is finding himself walking across the Sinai Desert. Oh, this is not a pleasant journey. And as he's walking, he's certainly got to be reflecting on what has transpired to me. Uh, what's transpired here? Why am I here? What's going on? And he must have come to grips to some extent with some of what he had done, some of the ways that he had treated his brothers. Maybe this is uh, part of the problem. Whether it occurs at this juncture or whether it occurs in the prison, I don't know. But at some juncture, our friend Joseph forgives Brothers. By the way, there can't be any person sitting here who's had any worse things done to them than what Joseph has done to them. Forgiveness, not revenge, is what God seeks for his people. And it God is going to raise up anyone. He, it first of all has to start with an individual humbly coming to grips with all these matters and forgiving. Oh, he can raise them up to a degree, but I'm talking the way that he wants to really raise them up. Forgiveness is important indeed. Okay? In any case, he has come also to an awareness that, hey, this is of God. God is the one who is working these matters. And so from this point on, this pivot, he now is going, we're now going to see the story develop in some further and very interesting fashions. By the way, we also see Judah changing. Because in this final test, when the threat of Benjamin being held back, and this might be beyond what Jacob can handle, Judah is the one that steps forward and says, oh, please don't do this. And we have this incredible impassioned speech. This incredible impassioned speech. Rather than the curtain, let's get some money for him. It's now. Please take me instead. So God is doing some things with Mr. Judah too. Right? No longer is he thinking purely of himself and, and all these other matters. And so we see the, uh, the, the resolution begin with the two times of the migration. And it is in the very beginning of chapter 40, uh, 6, verse 1, and following there that we get this very interesting statement about God appearing in a night vision to uh, Jacob and telling him, go down to Egypt, I'm with you, etc., etc. Everything is going to be okay. Da 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 da. And wow, an important, important uh, statement indeed. So the trip will, uh, these, these, I'm sorry, I meant to show this slide. Here are uh, uh, Asiatics coming down into Egypt. You can also see a few Egyptian guys doing their thing. You can tell the difference. You can tell the difference. 
okay? The Asiatics, the Semitic people here are coming in with their donkeys and their family, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the Israelites were not the only Asiatics uh, coming in to Egypt at this time. I'm using the term Asiatic because that's the term that the uh, Egyptians used for it. And so we have, in fact, the migration that takes place. And the two tellings here, um, the reason they're in blue in this instance here and letter B is in blue is because there's going to be one more instance where Jacob will foretell the future. In fact, it is introduced in a very interesting way, way in these la in the last days, so to speak, is one way that it can be translated. And the nuance here is this is going to be what's going to happen in the future to the family. And it is in this section that we encounter a very intriguing, intriguing uh, prophecy indeed. Because while the first movement has these dreams, I've kind of already pointed this out, we now have in the second movement this very interesting way in which uh, Jacob not only receives a dream, but then pro prophesies uh, what is going to uh, take place. And that prophecy, of course, is going to concentrate on, that's right, rulership will be with Judah, okay, not uh, otherwise, okay? And so, ironically here, uh, a testimony of God's grace and sovereignty is quite rich in the passage because Judah will be the one who finds, uh, sorry, the one whom rulership in the family will come. This is God's plan. Jacob may have had a plan. God has a different plan, right? And that plan for Joseph was for other purposes, not for the rulership of the family. The rulership of the family is to come out of Judah. And so we have two rulerships coming through the narrative. One, of course, um, uh, connected with Joseph. The other, importantly, connected with Judah. This, of course, uh, leads us uh, to, into the following. In chapter uh, 50, verse 20, let us read it together. So you can turn with me if you uh, like. And you can tell I'm having, I'm skipping some things uh, because of time. You can take them to the school of books. <laughs> Get more. Okay. In any case, uh, in verse um, uh, 19, Joseph is replying to his brothers who have uh, said, Well, you know, they have died now, and, and you know, we. He told us to tell you before he died, of course, no such thing, that uh, you should treat us well. You know, don't, don't punish us. I mean, they're, they're still afraid. And Joseph says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended here to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And what is, I think, uh, incredibly interesting here is, is that because of the binary nature of the narrative and everything that has been building all along, this has got to have a double intendra. It obviously means that he intended it to save them from famine. But because of chapter 38, we know that there's a need for salvation on another level. And I have good news. God is in the business of saving not just from fans, but more importantly, from the spiritual bankruptcy and devastation that results from such things. And the good news is he is a God of incredible grace. He is saving us not only to eternal life, but he's in the business of saving you today. From yourself, from your own sinfulness, by the strength of his word, the renewing of your mind through the scriptures, God is saying. He's a saving God. He's a saving God. And 
what is even, to me, the most marvelous thing. I worded it this way, and I'm going to read it because I, I, I can't possibly get it any better than what I wrote uh, yesterday. <laughs> God's problems. Absolutely. But perhaps better it would be for us to say his utter, utter sovereignty in his magnificence, how vivid might is manifested throughout this marvelous concluding Toledot, this, this narrative of Genesis. Being creator and king of the universe, we should expect nothing less. You meant it for evil. God meant it for truth. God meant it for you know how many times God pronounced in the beginning of this book, Tov? Seven times. That's not fortuitous. It is because at the very root of who he is, he is G-O-O-D. He is Tov. Do you believe that? In leadership, in following God, in worship. This is quite, quite, quite important. We must understand that the creator of the universe is G O O D. What he created was G O D. And he can even take evil intentions of humans and weave them in a way to bring glory to himself because he is G O O D. Yay, God! <laughs> now, I haven't said too much about how you should apply these passages. Time is such that, I, that we needed to try and cover things uh, adequately. But I want you to take what has been given to you and meditate on it. Think about it. Read back through the passage. I think you will see many ways. And the Holy Spirit, by the way, is really 